Hello, dear audience. We are celebrating our Feast of Healthy Thoughts and welcome. And thank you for having us with you in your homes and sharing the thoughts, the ideas, the love and service we can provide for you. Today is a special day. We have a very interesting topic. I recently came across with a couple of expressions that are originally coming from Mother Teresa. We know how wonderful her service was in this, in this world in general and in India specifically. How much she served, how much she loved, what a wonderful faith she had and how much hope did she give to the people. I want to read these five lines that are directly connected with her name. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. The fruit of service is peace. Many people remember whenever she gave them something, a book or something, she always left a little prayer note inside of the book, a card with prayer on it, which actually said something a little bit different. Without prayer, there is no faith. Without faith, there is no love. Without love, there is no service. Without service, there is no joy or peace. This card was always accompanying with, with a book that she gave to somebody. But then the other one that I read before this one comes from another occasion when a rich man had a chance to meet her and was very impressed with the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, he asked her if she has a business card. Mother Teresa digged into her purse a big bag with wooden handles that she was carrying with her all the time and took out a prayer card and gave it to him. He was not satisfied. He says, Mother, I was asking for a business card. Do you have one? And she kind of got confused because she had never thought about it. It says in the story that she had gotten so many business cards from so many people in the world that if you put them on top of each other, it will reach the heavens. But she hadn't even thought about it for herself. At night, she starts thinking about an idea to have a business card. And after several minutes of meditation, she comes up with these five lines. And I'm going to read it again. And we'll go from there. And we'll go line by line with Presbyteria Kiyaki. Thank you, Presbyteria, for offering this wonderful time. And we'll try to go into the depths of this prayer. It's, in some sense, it's a prayer. And to try to enlighten every detail of it, to see how did she start, where from, and where did she end up, and what is the journey. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. The fruit of service is peace. This is what she came up as a business card and from that on handed to the people who related to her or came to her life. Presbyter, I would like to start with the first line. When we were talking, you said it's so rich we can make one conversation on each line. Let's start with, with silence. What do you think about silence? Why did she start with silence, you think? Thank you, Arkadi. Hi, everyone. When I did a little research on the internet about this beautiful prayer, I'm very embarrassed as much as I've admired Mother Teresa from afar. I don't know too much about her life except what is easy to attain through the general public media. I've not done any personal research. I know that she came from Albania, that grew up in, the, in Eastern Europe, felt an early call as a young girl to serve others and went into teaching as a Catholic religious uh, nun. And uh, later on, after many years of service, received a call within the call, is what she said, and felt the strong urge to go to India and work with the dispossessed, the, the people who were treated like garbage, figuratively and literally, and attend to them as if she was attending and her sisters uh, and all those affiliated with her mission to Christ himself. Each person, every person was attended to as if he or she were Christ himself. And so for her to begin this prayer with silence teaches us a lot already. When I looked on the internet, there are several websites that have collected this prayer as well as other prayers and poems that Mother Teresa has written. So I urge people to 
get on the internet and any search engine will probably find some of the same places I found. In one of the websites, this prayer had an extra line. And the fruit of pr silence's prayer is actually the second line. Mm. The first line is this, a sacrifice to be real must cost, must hurt, we must empty ourselves. So with your permission, I want to read this again with that new first line because Wonderful. I think that helps us feel or sense more about what she meant about the fruit of silence is prayer. And so I'll start with the new first line for us to sit with us a few minutes together. A sacrifice to be real must cost, must hurt, we must empty ourselves. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. The fruit of service is peace. And so now when we think of the fruit of silence as prayer within the context of sacrifice, that it must cost, that it must hurt, that we must empty ourselves. When we think about silence, it is not the kind of silence we sometimes think of as just keeping our mouth shut, but our mind is wandering, our heart is attached to something else. It's an active effort of putting all our everyday commitments, our everyday priorities, all of our good distractions and not so good distractions aside on a back burner and if possible off the stove so that we can attend with utter openness reality. And what's reality with a capital R? Our abiding in the love of the living God thrice holy. When I was thinking of questions, it was kind of strange that the service brings to joy and peace. In my mind, I was thinking service brings suffering. How can it bring also peace? How can the peace and suffering relate to each other? Now it explains that it's the suffering that brings that silence, emptiness, emptying ourselves. Uh, that's, it's hard work. That's very interesting. Yeah. It's hard work. It's, we, it takes intention. Uh, it's hard work and trust. It takes hard work and innocence. It takes hard work and in many ways when the Lord says uh, be as innocent as doves and as wise as serpents, for the, and he, this is what a, a follower of Christ looks like. Well, in our modern day situation, that must sound pretty strange. Mm -hmm. Because so many of us are running around being sophisticated and cool and in and uh, are finding our, desperately finding our 15 minutes of fame at the expense of our brother and sister next to us. You know, it's funny, um, again, in doing a little bit of research, someone asked Mother Teresa when she received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979. They asked her, how can you promote world peace? What can anyone do to promote world peace? And her response was really, Amazing, she said, go home and love your family. I would think those persons who are in your everyday life, be it people who are related to you by blood or through marriage or by who are your family by engaging them, us engaging them on our daily walk through the day, go home and love them. And what does that mean to love? And I think that's what this, po this poem is talking to, uh, is that we are supposed to put our agendas <coughs> off the stove, never mind on a back burner, and be receptive to the person who is before us. It ties together with the prayer. If they go home and love, it means that they have to have service as a fruit. It means it's not like sentimental love that they're going to say, oh, honey or darling or hug the kids, but it has to come up with service in their family which eventually will give a fruit of peace in the family and it will sprout from the family into the world. It's what gives life. And sometimes the, what gives life at first hurts. At first, all we encounter is the sacrifice and the pain and the fear because trusting God in the darkness of His love, we can't see what's going on sometimes. None of us have been where we are to this point. And so for any of us to fall into the trap of the sin of familiarity, and we've talked about the sin of familiarity in past episodes, where, okay, I, I, I've got my act together. 
I, I, I can go forward from this point forward kind of knowing uh, what, you know, I've got, it, I've got it together, I can negotiate my life. And so when we fall for that lie, spiritually, psychologically, and practically, we're headed for trouble eventually at some point. Just last night, I had a couple of conversations with people in, in ministry. One in particular, someone who's been in the ministry for many years, someone I love and respect very much. And I say that with fear and trepidation because I'm thinking if this person is having problems loving someone, what's that mean for me? And so in this conversation that I had with this person in ministry who's been a pastor for many years, very well respected, and I've heard this from many other people, this is why he's coming to my mind, it's not just this person, that he comes from a home where one of his parents showed absolutely no love to him. And yet he became such a loving person. It's sort of a paradox. How does that happen? Christian I, I, paradox. It's a real, you know, Christian <laughs> paradox. And now at this age range where this parent is much older, but still maybe even harder on my friend that was sharing with me, even harder, even, even you know, you're, you might be with, this parent might be with us another six weeks, six months, six years, and my friend is paying a harder price of trying to show up to be the good child and instead of being rewarded with some kind of affection and recognition of, oh, you've, you've attended well to me and your family, is treated with even more arrogance, more contempt. And a part of it might be this person's issues, obviously. This person's unwillingness to recognize the gifts surrounding this person because this person has a wonderful family and somehow the family around this person is not only bearing fruit, the fruit of this person and close immediates are bearing fruit. And to listen to how do I do the right thing when I don't feel love for this person. Mm -hmm. I don't feel love. I haven't felt love for decades. And I said, this is what love looks like. You're numbed out. You wouldn't be doing this if you didn't have inside you that healthy spark placed within all human beings for a healthy desire, for a healthy relationship with a healthy mother and father. That's in us, somehow. And that was not allowed to sprout. And so that's, we're not allowed to sprout in a way we could normally see through a regular way. I think it's sprouting to the side. I think it's going, I think it's bearing fruit in many other ways, but not through the front door. And my friend is looking, Nothing's coming through the front door. But I see love over the decades that my friend has been attending to this parent who has been unappreciative, not kind. And also my friend taking care of, of the responsibilities given to him and his family and his friends and his ministry. So he's really been trying to be real at, with his real life as well as attend to this parent. And for me, that's an astounding act of love to do the right thing, even when you know your heart is frozen or turned to marble because that's what happens when there's nothing back and all you get is sulfuric acid instead of love from a person. And so I just said, you know, when the time comes and this, if, if this parent doesn't change, maybe in five, 10, 15 years from now, God willing, we're both around and healthy and talking, you might find your heart melting and you'll notice that the love was always there and in fact it's grown mm -hmm. but it was growing in other places and you couldn't feel it because it, this part of your um, being had to harden so that you could go on with your life and I'm astounded with the gentleness and tenderness that you've been treating this parent even though all you get back is ingratitude and verbal and psychological abuse. And I'm bringing this up only because I think in some way many of us are facing these kinds of relationships. How do I attend to someone with whom I need to be in relationship with or choose to be in relationship with in a way that is loving even if I'm not feeling the emotion? And how do I do this in a way where I'm being attentive to the work God has given to me in other parts of my life too? Spouse, children, work, friendship, it's not an easy thing. And so she was right to say, go home and love your family with your eyes open. She says, silence brings to prayer and prayer brings to faith. In this example that you're, uh, that you're telling, we start from love, straight right in the middle. If we go 
by the steps of the prayer, mm -hmm. we start in the middle. It, it means that the person has already faith and has already been praying before to come to love and then the love will go to service. Uh, even though, like you said, the love does not have emotional aspect of it, but the love is present because of the faith and prayer before that. Now, what my question is going to be, how can someone pray if doesn't have the faith? On the one hand, God respects freedom, human freedom, absolutely. God does not, that's rigged in a sense that God does not disrespect our free will, will not impede any of that. And on the other hand, everything that's happened in creation is happening under the watchful, caring eye of God, lovingly directing all of the course of history back to Him. How? I don't know. How can both be happening? God is leading all of us back to Him at some point, you know, for the all in all, as we believe, as Christians. And at the same time, God radically, unconditionally respects freedom. Both are true. Philosophically, logically, they don't make any sense about being true at the same time. As a Christian, all I can say is I affirm that both are happening. It's not my, not my job to, to be able to explain how that happens because that would make me God or equal to God, and I'm not. And so that's the first thing. But it's rigged. This prayer is rigged, actually, especially now that I see the new, front, new first line that maybe she wrote in some places, maybe she didn't write in other places, which is why it's not everywhere. Because authentic love, and the kind of love I think Mother Teresa is bearing witness to, is agape. There's many words for love in Greek, but I'm sure she's referring to agape love. And w one of the defining dimensions of love, agape love, is sacrifice, self-sacrifice. And so the new first line, a sacrifice to be real must cost, must hurt, we must empty ourselves. And so already that's a depiction of authentic love, authentic agape. But how does that happen? It happens because all of this is rigged because it's all, that we are all in the center of the palm of God's hand. That for us to have any impulse of wanting to be close to God, any good thought that we have that's true to us, somehow at some point before creation was ever established was already put into our hearts by God. And according to ancient Christian spiritual tradition, by God the Father. Both Latin speak, the Latin church and the Greek church would say that desire, that kind of holy desire is put into the heart of every human person by God the Father himself. That's something to think about. So that even when I have a little impulse that feels like it's from me and it's a tiny impulse, it feels like a flicker, not even a, a flicker big enough to start a little, fi little campfire of love for God. How is it going to really catch and grow if it doesn't look like it's anything, it's so tiny? Even that little flicker would not have happened if God didn't somehow underneath sort of help that happen with our own free will sort of aligning, saying, oh yes, this is good. For us to say it's good, it's, it's a free will response to something. We're not saying, oh, it's bad, yuck. Mm -hmm. We're saying, oh, I want this. And sometimes we can be in a place where we notice these flickers of love and we get angry and say, oh, it's bad. But deep down we know it's still good. We are held, we are loved, we are cradled even in the arms of a loving God from the very beginning. For us to even say, Abba, Father, even to say that imperfectly, clumsily, we are already aligning ourselves and responding to something already planted in us by our own free will. That's as close as I can to describe something way beyond us mm -hmm. from my little perch in the church. From previous episodes, we have been speaking about different other topics. I think we were talking about faith, and you quoted Peter's words, I believe, help my unbelief. That's another dilemma. How do I believe if I need help in my belief, and yet I say I believe? And help my unbelief, it means that I am full of unbelief, but I'm reaching out, and I want your help. If I have it, I have it. If I don't have it, I don't have it. But in this case, I don't have it, but I believe that I want to have it. Well, you're talking about what do we put our, our faith in? What do we put our, and remember the Greek word for faith, and we've talked about this in the past, is the Greek word pistis. And pistis has two meanings, two sides of the same coin. And the one side is 
the side that most people think about, which is the content of the faith. We believe in God. We believe in, let's say, a Holy Trinity. We believe in various specific affirmations of what it means to be a, a follower of Christ. Ancient Christianity has creeds as affirmations to say this is what we believe as opposed to other things that we would be believing or not believing. They don't define the miracle of who God is, but they describe and point us to it, and these words are important. The flip side of the, of the belief is, of pistis is trust. So we can read that whole Bible passage, and I think we talked about that when we were together when we discussed this little passage in the past, that, okay, if, if Peter said to the Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, we could easily, just as honestly, substitute the word trust. I trust you, Lord, help my mistrust. And what did the Lord do? Peter was walking on the water, and Jesus was on, walking on the water, and, and then the sea started getting churned up, and the waves got bigger, and the weather got, it sounds, it got more stormy-like. I, I don't remember the weather report of, from that Bible story very well, but the seas were being more violent. And when he saw that, he was distracted by the waves and started to, to, to sink. In his sinking, he said, I, I, I trust you, Lord, help my mistrust. That's all of us. That's all of us. And so he was distracted by the reality of the world around him, the conventional reality. We have to be careful. Conventional reality, wherever we are, in those centuries, in the centuries of the Middle Ages, uh, 50 years ago or today, conventional reality always has its own kind of gospel, mm -hmm. small g. And in some of the Greek liturgical services prior to Easter, during Holy Week, they talk, they talk about the fallen world's gospel. They, they use the word kakovagelion. It mm -hmm. sounds so guttural and awful. But kakovagelion is the opposite of the evagelion. Evagelion in Greek means the gospel, the good news. Kakovagelion is the same old, same old bad news that tries to distract us, the evagelion, from the real gospel, from the real good news, to its the conventional bad news. And so, sure, all of us get trapped with that, but the more we look at, okay, we're living our conventional lives, do we live our conventional lives, excuse me, perhaps a little unconventionally? Who's our God? Is it the God that the, ma the mass media sort of wants us to follow, or is it somebody else? And these are the choices we have to make a day at a time, a minute at a time sometimes. I remembered him from the Armenian a church which says, the waves of the daily life are shipwrecking me all day long. Good captain, save me from this shipwreck. In the story of Peter and Jesus, we don't see that sometimes, or we may miss that. But in reality, when we look into the, this hymn, or many others, or the lives of the saints, we see that interpreted or enlightened in a different way that we are always on those waters and there are always waves around us and we always need that faith. In another episode where Mother Teresa meets with a doctor, this doctor says that, I don't believe in God, Mother. What can I do? What she suggests is to go home and pray. And pray and pray and pray and eventually you will believe. And she goes home and does it. It again brings this uh, conflict of logic. If I don't believe and I ask Lord to give or help my unbelief, now this doctor is talking to Mother Teresa and saying, I don't believe in God. What can I do? It means that I want to believe. That little seed inside, even to ask the question, is mm -hmm. that little fleck of a spark that was put in each of our hearts by God Himself. And so the beauty, and you're saying this, reminds me, oh my gosh, this is even more beautiful than I even first noticed, uh, because the fruit of silence is prayer, which is saying, when we try to pray, as the Lord would use the metaphor uh, in the scriptures of, go into your closet and pray to God the Father in secret. It means we will, it, it's not easy. We will feel alone. It may be dark to surrender ourselves in that quiet darkness where we don't know what's going to happen next. Entrusting and turning to God, our Father, our Daddy, is an incredibly courageous and loving thing at the same time. It is being childlike. It is turning to the Father anew every moment in the presence of, of God. And so the fruit of silence 
It's prayer. Okay, I don't have to feel crazy when I want to pray, and, I, and nothing happens. Mother Teresa is saying, nothing's going to happen. It's going to be silent. It's going to be silent. Enter the silence with gratitude. Enter the silence with trust. Enter the silence with receptivity and with openness and that suppleness, that childlike suppleness. Enter that silence with open hands and open being and wait in that open way, connecting to the other and wait. That is the essence of prayer. When we look at the Greek word for prayer, prosephi, the foundation of the Greek word, it really doesn't mean dialogue. It, it implies a, it, that that can be there, ab absolutely. Words can be there. But it, it's the connection, the good connection, of being well grounded in the presence of the other. And no words need to be spoken. Interesting story from Anthony Bloom's life. An old lady comes to him and says that she does not succeed in her prayers. She cannot pray. And very practical suggestion he gives. He says, go home when there is nobody home and start knitting and create as much quiet as possible and try to concentrate only on knitting to the degree where you can hear the thread, you can hear the movement of those needles. And the yarn. Yarn, and, and she goes home and she does it and she says it was amazing because she couldn't hear anything else but the needles touching to each other, like making this very tiny noise. And it meant, it meant that she completely disconnected herself from everything else, concentrating on one thing only, and that's where she finds the, the prayer. Now for everyday life, the prayer does not start with that first line. And I think there is a, there's intention there because the author or her did not want to scare people with the pain, with the sacrifice, with this and with that, but just start with silence. But that silence is going to bring those. It, well, right, to be truly silent is a sacrifice. As we were saying earlier about putting our priorities aside. In fact, maybe not only aside or on the back burner, off the stove completely, so we could be silent, so we could be attentive so we could be present. It must cost, yes. We're not paying attention to everyday worries and seductions and what the conventional gods want, <laughs> the gods of conventionality. <laughs> but they, they want their sacrifice every minute of the day. And so I think that was very, uh, a, very, a very good insight uh, that, uh, that she probably did not want to intimidate people with that f other first line that I found and just begin with the fruit of silence because that really does bring everything there. Uh, now I'm going to tell you a funny story from my life. Uh, I was used to stay home alone from very early age of life because my parents worked and I was a school. I was going to school, coming home. It was a small village, everybody knows each other. So it wasn't a big deal to be home. But for a child, it was kind of scary to be alone. And sometimes I would start talking to myself or singing or doing something to to avoid the silence that was really scary. When there is silence, it's, it's mysterious. And when you disturb that silence, it seems like you're surrounded with something. Now within that silence, the prayer can be found. Within that silence, also fear or um, dis distortion can be found. People would go crazy if there was too much silence around them. So they kind of distract themselves from this silence to avoid the, the damage. Well, it's also hard work. Let me just add a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because even you'll find many ascetic writers over the centuries that would say even the most holy person needs to take time off. Not necessarily that you don't love God, but it is a good thing to do something pleasurable in the human sense of the word. God made us to enjoy the world. God made us to live life with gratitude and I won't say exploit it in a way that, that has been taken in a bad way to, to, uh, to use and abuse and throw away, but to enjoy and perhaps even leave better. <laughs> and that's a good thing, to have times of relaxing, to have times of recreation. We get recreated when we have genuine recreation. And so even in the spiritual life, 
there are many dimensions to it, and some of it can be playful and fun, and that's a, a good thing. That's not a bad thing. It's all within the presence of God. God enjoys that with us when we have our hearts open as, as we're enjoying these gifts of life. At the same time, when it's time to be silent, and you're talking about being a young child and kind of you know, noticing the silence. Well, to me, that says a little bit about Akadi when he was young, that even as a young child, you were noticing the other somehow, capital O, the other, the otherness of God. And so when we enter silence in this manner, we are opening ourselves up to encounter. And that's wonderful, and it takes a little bit of work, and it's wonderful. And at times, it's time for that. And sometimes, it's time to do the other, as I said, the other more enjoyable things. And sometimes, we may not be ready or confused with other issues that are distracting us from God's love, maybe something uh, that's giving us fear or anxiety. And that being alone is not leading us into this fruitful silence, but to isolation, all right? Instead of fruitful silence, we're alone. And, and we're kind of regurgitating our issues and our anxieties. And how many times do I get up in the middle of the night with my mind racing with issues that worry me? And I'm thinking, this happens to me. There might be one or two other people around that have a similar t issue of their minds sometimes racing with worries. And you know, how do we deal with that? You know, when we're racing like that, when our minds are racing like that, in a worrying kind of way with our anxieties that, that easily distracts us from the love of God. And it's hard to sort of acknowledge these and give them to God because we can't figure everything out. God does that and we can just do what we can do. One of the Russian comedians has this line. He's standing in front of a high story building. There's lots of people in the streets and he looks around and says, there's so many people around there's nobody to talk to. Like water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. No one to talk to. Comedians, I think, tend to be very intelligent, very sensitive in a creative, artistic way, and also IQ way. It's kind of both. You have to be able to see a lot, several steps down the pike in an intellectual kind of way, and also have the creativity to play with that. And, so, and, and, and then a heart to be able to put it together for human consumption. And sometimes I don't like a lot of comedians because the way the heart, their heart mixes that up is sad. It tells me they don't have much love for humanity. The little bit you just said about this person sounds like he has a lot of love for humanity, that he wants to engage people to, for something real, for real communion, I would say. That's my mm -hmm. guess as a, as a Christian who serves in theology and as a Christian who serves in psychology. He's seeking for authentic connection, authentic encounter for communion. Um, in the presence of God. That's my planet. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the other side? If he feels alone, I would say he feels lonely because there's so much people but he cannot uh, engage with any one of them. Isn't that time to find the, the other, like you mentioned? To exactly. That's the cry for me. When, when I pray a similar prayer or a cry of water, water everywhere but not a drop to drink, or people, people everywhere, but not one who to share, to give life with, then um, that can for me be, and I think an opportunity for other people to be a place of surrender, saying, okay, God, you're, you can feed, you can, you can lead me and others uh, to those green pastures, uh, through, through this darkness to those green pastures, and again, to enter the holy silence with faith. Um, there are many there are many people who are suffering in this world. That's not a hidden fact. It's, it's everywhere. And with many that I have noticed, with the mess that is in their life, sometimes it seems like very easy to fix. Easy in a sense that the so that, that the solution, the direction is obvious. You have to go this direction, and it will be solved. On the other side, when you start going that direction, it's going to be difficult. You're not going to be able to uh, enjoy or uh, relax as much as you do now, but the mess will be cleaned. In one of the examples that I found in Mother Teresa's book, she suggests a woman who comes to her with the request to help her, her daughter. I think she couldn't talk. Mother Teresa says, uh, 
do you have any addictions? Do you have any anything that is very important for you, but it's not really something that you need to be doing? And the woman immediately admits or confesses that she has some kind of uh, very common drug addiction that is not a legal thing, but it's common in India. And she says, just go and don't do that anymore. And your child will be well. Um, very interesting that after a while, the story says that she comes back and thanks her. She says it worked. Now when I, again, I'm going to refer to the first line. It's a sacrifice. It's a, it's a pain. It's, it's a hardship that leads to this silence where you will start praying and go all the way down to the to the peace that you will find in your in your life. Um, now, I would like to hear your comments about this, relating to everyday life, where we find lots of lots of um, distortion, lots of pain, and um, how can people find this? How can people find that one thing that will hurt them if they get rid of, or that one? road that takes to that narrow gate and they can suffer a little bit but have a hope of, of getting better, finding the final destination, the peace. First thing to remember is that we're not lost. God knows where to find us. God knows where we are. God's there. We are already found. The second we start coming to our senses, like in the Bible story of the prodigal son who squandered everything of his inheritance that he demanded from his father and lived a most unclean life till he finally hit his rock bottom, which is a very, very low rock bottom, uh, because the story says that he was so hungry he would have gladly fed off the fodder given to the pigs. And in ancient Israel there was nothing more unclean than a pig and death. Those are the two major most, anything having to do with death and uh, pigs were very unclean. And so to have said he would eat amongst the pigs it was also a metaphor to say, I'd be in communion with them. When we meditate on that, uh, when he came to his senses, when that finally hit him, that little spark hit him, oh my gosh, already he was saved from that moment when he came to his senses and said, I must return to my father's house. And so when we have any of these little sparks, no matter how bad our day is, no matter how much we blow it, and we can blow it, and people do suffer, and there are bad things, I don't have the capability to enumerate the many ways we human beings can be hurt, can be injured, can be betrayed, can be uh, oppressed. I can't name them, there's so many. But the second any of us, no matter what these situations are, come to our senses, have a little spark of turning things around. Already God the Father, we would say, is running like crazy toward us. And we're already in the center of God's hand. And so what do we do from there? You know, and I've said in the past, in various ways, we pick up the 500-pound phone, which hurts, and we reach out in some way. We reach out in prayer. We reach out to another person. We do ask for help, sometimes to concrete people to help us move to the next step and always to God within that context. Some of the impediments to authentic relationship, to this two type of relationships, either it's life-giving, we give life, or it's life-effacing. So if it's of God, it's life-giving. If it's not of God, it's life-effacing. That's really important to sort of keep in mind. And so when people are oppressed mm -hmm. through, through slavery, an abusive relationship that ancient Christian uh, spiritual writers bear witness to, and now contemporary psychology through the trauma research, which is really incredible to see trauma research types catching up with the fathers of the church. Which, that oppression reduces free will. Mm. The, that's the bad news. When people are oppressed, free will is turned down, sometimes a lot. The good news is because we are still created in the image like this of God, it never goes away. It's still there, but it's, it's, it's reduced. And so when you were talking about just being sick, I realized, oh my gosh, I'd never had that thought before. Sickness is a kind of oppression on the human body, on the human psyche, on the human soul. So if we are sick by an illness that we catch, if we are sick by a condition that comes on us, if we are sick at our own hand, if we have an addiction, or we have some kind of a compulsive behavior that brings maladies to our own body, well, isn't that interesting? Even through our own free will, we've had a hand in 
And sometimes we don't have an active hand in, but sometimes we may have an active hand in our own, the, the, own, the demise of our own free will has been turned down. And so as you said, I want to go, I want to call a doctor, I know it's the right thing, and somehow I don't do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for, to, have, to, to be a little bit more merciful to our own selves and our brothers and sisters will have a hard time doing that because free will is turned down. But that's why we scream all the louder, do it anyway. Do what you can anyway. Make a phone call because it's that much more important and the resources are there for help. What? I don't know. That's in God's providence. Thank you very much, Presbyter. We, dear audience, uh, we'll talk about the fruit of prayer. We, came to, we talked about the silence today. We kind of um, led our steps towards prayer, that that's where it starts from silence to prayer, even though, as the first line says, it kind of can be difficult. It may, may require sacrifice. And in this story that Mother Teresa gives a suggestion to the woman, she clearly says, you have to bring some sacrifice. God is not going to help you just because. You have to participate in it. You have to bring your offerings. What can you do for your child? And then the fruits will come. And so the silence is also going to require this kind of sacrifice from us. And then we'll probably have more free will to stand up and pray. Uh, thank you, Presbyter, again. We'll go to the next line, and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time.